I think one of the most well-known time periods in world history is the Second World War. From a purely narrative perspective, World War II has the best stories in history. You have legendary figures among the Allies and Axis. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Churchill, Eisenhower, Patton. The list is absolutely endless. World War II is a classic battle of good and evil where the resolution is truly in doubt for most of the fight. There are staggering defeats, times where it seems like all hope is lost, before defining moments like D-Day turn the tide of the war, eventually leading to the end of the fascist dictators and the freeing of oppressed people. Countless movies, video games, books, and all forms of entertainment still get made to this day, placing the setting in Nazi Germany or on the south coast of France. History, in contrast to the entertainment versions of World War II, are much muddier in terms of who is good and who is evil. In India, two months before the fight on the beaches of Normandy, a battle started that would decide the fate of Asia. A battle that, similar to D-Day, would change the momentum against the invading Japanese army and ultimately lead to an independent and free India a few short years later. I'm Matt Dahlberg, and the Battle of Imphal and Kohima is a hidden gem of history. Far away from the widely known struggle in Europe, in 1944, the situation was this in Southern Asia. The Japanese had forced their way into Burma after previous victories in 1942. This pushed the British soldiers to withdraw west and take up defensive positions in India. Japan only needs to take India to secure the final supply lines and air bases of the Allies, all but ensuring an Axis takeover of Asia. The Japanese army has delayed in taking this final fight for a couple of reasons. First, the jungle terrain is very difficult to manage a large number of troops. Second, if the battle is still going on in monsoon season, it will be impossible to reinforce or even supply the Japanese army with basic necessities like ammunition or rations for the soldiers. So, what had changed in just two short years? Definitely not the setting of the battle, but the Allies, especially the native Indian soldiers fighting under the British flag, have improved their combat prowess mostly due to the training of General William Slim. Slim commanded the British 14th Army. Additionally, more and more English troops were arriving every day and things were not going very well for the Japanese in the Pacific. If India was ever to be taken, the time was now for the Japanese. Leading the Japanese march to Delhi were two very different men. One, a military veteran, Masakazu Kawabe, respected for defeating the British earlier in the war in Asia, despite being outnumbered by Allied forces. The second, an ideologue in Subhas Chandra Bose. Bose was a politician that originally served in the Indian National Congress before defecting and joining the Nazis to help liberate the Indians from the British rule. Bose helped found the Special Bureau for India in Berlin and broadcasted nightly for Free India Radio. Bose married an Austrian woman named Emil Schenkel and even met with Hitler during his time in Germany. Bose led the newly revitalized Indian National Army, cooperating with the Japanese 15th Army. The Axis strategy to take British-controlled India down was for Kowabe to take charge in the tactical elements of warfare and for Bose's presence to win over the hearts and minds of the largely Indian fighting force. If Bose could convince his countrymen to desert, and Kowabe could catch the Allies off guard with the assault, then victory would be theirs in short order, well before the monsoon season. The Japanese soldiers were given a small window to complete their mission. They were given a total of three weeks of rations with the clear goal of capturing the Allied supply lines in that time or face an impossible uphill battle. There would be no compromise. The Battle of Imphal and Kohima started with minor victories and advancement of the Japanese troops. Japan was hoping to surprise the Allied forces, which they did but were unable to wipe them out, only managing to push them further west. In Kohima, a large group of soldiers attempted to cut off the northern city, effectively isolating Imphal from any help from Kohima or any other British reinforcements or aid. All that stood in their way was the 50th Indian Parachute Brigade, 
which was training and not expecting an attack at this time. Despite not having any fresh water and being nearly surrounded on all sides, the brigade did not desert or instantly retreat. They held firm and fought the superior Japanese forces to a stalemate for six days, wasting nearly a third of the Japanese rations in that small skirmish. If you were to tell me to do anything active for more than 12 hours without any hydration, my body simply would have given up. The Indian forces, however, stood resolute and delayed until they withdrew and were eventually replaced by the full might of the British 14th Army. The Japanese gained the upper hand in both Kohima and Imphal, but it was short-lived. Because of the delay, the Japanese were unable to stop the Allied forces supply the ground troops through airdrops. In contrast, help would never come for the Japanese warriors and what was originally a three-week mission turned into three months of pure hell for the invaders and became one of the worst defeats for the Axis. And according to author Robert Lyman, the Japanese regard the Battle of Imphal to be their greatest defeat ever, and it gave Indian soldiers a belief in their own martial ability and showed that they could fight as well or better than anyone else. This would be the last great effort by the Land of the Rising Sun to win the war. Some describe the Battle of Imphal and Kohima as one of the most fiercely fought conflicts in recorded history, and in 2013 was recognized as the greatest battle in British history by their National Army Museum, beating out the more widely known victories such as D-Day and Waterloo. Britain, Japan, and other involved countries acknowledge the great heroism, bravery, and tragic loss at Imphal and Kohima. While more known in England, this decisive victory is largely unknown to the average American citizen, and somewhat surprisingly, the modern Indian government does not recognize the contributions of their great people in India those three months in 1944. For the U.S., it's simple. There was almost no American participation in this fight. However, for India, it's a much more complicated answer as to why this battle is not known. There were nearly 55,000 Japanese casualties, a staggering amount considering there were originally 150,000 troops at the beginning of the siege. However, most did not die due to gunshots, mortars, tanks, or bombs like in most battles of that time. Instead, the reason for most of the losses were starvation, exhaustion, and disease resulting from the lack of food provided to the soldiers. In contrast, the soldiers under the British command were treated very differently. While the Japanese and the Chandra Bose led Indian national armies were abandoned and left to rot by their leadership, the British forces, commanded by William Slim, made sure proper care was provided to all of his troops. If men were injured, he saw fit to have them airlifted if need be. Slim was very aware of how much of a role morale can play into war and did his part to keep his men motivated, ready, and alert. Slim had been working with the Indian people and army since 1918 during the First World War, where he had been a captain during that time. His men had fought with him bravely in Sudan, Ethiopia, and several other countries in Africa earlier in the war. Out of all of the endless battles and skirmishes, Imphal and Kohima in northern eastern India was easily Slim's greatest victory in his extensive military career. This is where the difference in treatment of troops is relevant. While most, if not all people would agree, an independent nation is generally better than an oppressed or colonized nation, look at the way those fighting for freedom behaved in India. Chandra Bose spoke of freeing India from the tyranny of Britain, a similar cause as the American Revolution. But the way Bose aligned himself and his army with the most notorious and fearsome regime in history, as well as combining forces with the Axis to slay his own compatriots in India, stains his legacy. Bose is observed to be less of a freedom fighter and more of a radical who butted heads with Mahatma Gandhi, lost, and in his bitterness became an accessory to the ideal he claimed he hated most, an authoritarian foreign power. The point of all this context is for me to ask a simple question. Who were the good guys and who were the bad guys in this battle from the perspective of India? It's easy as an American to simply say the Allied forces were the do-gooders of the world 
because they fought against Hitler and everyone who opposes Nazi Germany is good. But by that same token, shouldn't Americans view Chandra Bose as someone to admire? Someone who fought for freedom and was willing to do whatever it took to obtain it. History is full of lessons, some easier than others. In World War II, you could summarize the entire conflict with Germany and the Axis were bad, America and the Allies are good, and end it there, as so many in the entertainment industry like to conclude. What most people forget is that there were militaries representing more than 30 nations and territories in the Second World War, including some of which you would never expect, like New Zealand or Brazil. All of them had different reasons for being there. Some acted in self-defense, others provoked and pillaged, and still others were ripped into a near-civil war because of actions happening halfway across the planet. If I were to ask you which country lost the most civilian and military lives combined, would you have guessed China? China was more or less an innocent bystander at the start of the war, but historians estimate somewhere in the range of 20 to 50 million Chinese lost their lives mostly due to Japanese war crimes similar to those seen in Auschwitz or Buchenwald thousands of miles away. There is so much history we don't see, even in the most visible time in mankind's past. This is why the Battle of Imphal and Kohima is a hidden gem of history. If you have someone in mind who you think should be highlighted as a hidden gem of history, or just want to learn about an undervalued time in history, feel free to email the show at hiddengemsofhistory at gmail.com with your suggestion. Hidden Gems of History could not be made without the help of so many people. This episode especially could not be made without the History Guide. The History Guide is a YouTube content creator with over 650,000 subscribers and more than 80 million total views on his videos. The History Guide posts multiple videos a week, and is a great choice for history buffs and students looking for homework help alike. Please support him with a like or subscription if you like content similar to this podcast. As always, I'm Matt Dahlberg, and this was Hidden Gems of History.